the wind blows softly through the hills. The only sound we hear is a sound of soft footsteps. The forest covers the hills. The vegetation is thick, cool and inviting. The sky is so blue in the clear mountain air that it hurts the eyes to look up. Located far away from the nearest village, the travelers enter by accident a secret valley with steep sides and a cold river running through its cleft. This is a holy place. Here, hidden from strangers' eyes, the sunny slopes are cleared while the travelers, a sangha of Buddhist monks, prepare to carve and sculpt one of the world's most amazing monasteries. Protected by the valley's isolation and softly spoken prayers, the valley was pure and free from the pressures of the world beyond. Work began slowly. The rock was studied and marked. Strong hands gripped the chisels and swung the hammers. Their efforts were not random. They had a vision. Their vision was in place before the chisel first met the rock. As the work progressed, the mountain gave way to fate and the monks moved forward into the cool darkness. The seasons changed. Every monsoon, the sky darkened and torrential rain flowed down the mountainside. Time was measured not in years, but in generations. The discipline of work and the strength of their prayers soon took shape and the monastery grew. Kings, merchants, travelers and local pilgrims contributed freely. They sent artisans, painters and scores of workers to work side by side with the monks. The outside world was changing. In the isolated valley, the monks were unaware of the wars and the politics that would soon change their lives. The Vakartaka king, the main sponsor of the works, dies suddenly. The circumstance of his death is a mystery. His son ascends the throne, but fails to get the support of the warlords. Civil war and territorial greed soon denies the monks of the support to continue their work. Slowly, the workers leave the site. Many of the caves are left unfinished and abandoned. The monks continue to keep the monastery active, but without sponsorship and the protection of the king, they are left helpless. With a heavy heart and reluctantly, the monks move away from the valley that had housed them for many generations from 200 BC to 728 AD. The work of 800 years has come to an end. The departing monks walk one last time through the caves. The spectacular paintings and sculptures of the Buddha sit serene and peaceful, almost telling them not to worry. At another time, on another day, the monastery will come back to life. The messages of faith that they have carved and painted will once again tell the story of the Master. Stories 
that will make people walk through the caves asking themselves what are the teachings of the Buddha that could inspire generations to build these wonderful monuments. As the last lamp blows out with the wind, the sweet smell of incense vanishes, the sounds of bells and gongs stop, and the whispering prayers are silent. The caves give themselves to the advancing forest. The vegetation covers the mouths of the caves. Rains move mud down the mountain and cover the footpath. The now silent monastery slips into the pages of unwritten history, forgotten and lost. It was the year 1819. The sun was shining bright in the sky and a group of young British officers are walking through the forest on a hunt. They are joking and talking. One of them spots a tiger and the chase begins. The officers give chase. The feet are pounding the ground and the tiger runs down a valley. The men spot the tiger and are about to climb down the valley when suddenly the tiger vanishes. The British officers reach the bottom of the valley and find themselves confronted by rich vegetation. The valley is like paradise. There are monkeys swinging from the branches, birds singing, the rushing flow of the river. The officers are struck by the peace and beauty of the valley and investigate further. As they climb down into the valley, the shapes of the now concealed caves become visible. The officers enter the caves and are first struck by a flood of colors and mysterious culture. The walls are drenched in color, so intimately do the paints belong to the murals and the murals to the walls as if they were wedded together from the very beginning. The officers realize that they are at a holy place a place in history and worship. It was these officers of the Madras army who rediscovered and named these caves. Ajanta is a village five kilometers away as a crow flies and it was the first name that came to mind. These are the Ajanta Caves, paying tribute to a glorious past and the invincible spirit of man. They are some of the finest examples of rock-cut temples in the world, and indeed, a pioneering endeavor in the whole of Asia. They were excavated from the hard, volcanic rock of the Sahyadri Mountains to one side of a U-shaped ravine above the Vaghora River. The architects of these projects were so proficient that some of the caves they excavated reach almost a hundred feet into the rock. We humbly recognize what enormous power of pursuit these ancient people possessed, who had the courage to assault the very body of the rock to overcome the resistance of the stone, and then, with infinite patience, go through the preparatory stages before the alien material was ready to accept their offerings. They illuminated the dark enclaves with their idea and imagination, using the whole world as a memorized model. As if this was not enough, they transferred their substance with the spectacular symbology of Buddhist concepts. The atmosphere inside the caves was charged with spiritual resonance. The constant chanting of prayers by thousands of people through hundreds of years and the awe-inspiring unity of all the existing artistic expressions have given them their sanctity. But 
Ajanta belongs to the past. The vision that fueled this masterpiece is gone. Ajanta was not created for the sake of art, but the creators pledged to give their lives over to religion. Therefore, now when we look at Ajanta, we need to evaluate the zeal that nurtured its art. The modern objective mind seeks artistic excellence alone. And since Ajanta has it in ample measure, we cherish its intrinsic worth and basic humanism, notwithstanding the fact that the dedicated ones may resent the loss of those faith-tinged values which once inspired the artist to create. Sculpture and painting grew simultaneously closer, complementing each other. Today, only parts of the paintings of the walls remain. The color on the sculptures has almost vanished. Even so, we tend to close our eyes and wonder, how did they look in their original newness? Kings and kingdoms who funded the creation of Ajanta have walked into history and have been forgotten. But we know little of the artist who worked here from where he came. Then, did he move on? Or did he live and die here in the caves? The paintings are his only signature. Beyond that, he is silent. Were there at a time many painters or a few? Had each cave its master artist? What company of artisans had he with him? These questions, among many others, remain unanswered. The master's touch is there in the tender drawing and paint of the eyes, mouths and finger. He created a style. With his few lines and brush strokes, made a person speak his entire character. It is beyond man's power to absorb what took the artist centuries to create. Climbing the stony stairs step by step, one is further removed from the green valley. As one draws nearer the adobe, one's anticipation heightens. Strewn ahead are 29 caves, each calling us to venture into a journey of faith and endurance. The interiors of these Buddhist caves were divided into the Vihara or living quarters and the Chaitya hall or place of worship majestic enough to house images and sculptures of deities they worshipped. The Chaitya halls were dedicated to Lord Buddha and were considered as the places of worship. These were large rectangular chambers separated by rows of pillars into a central nave surrounded by aisles on three sides for circumambulation during prayer. It also had a sanctuary opposite the entrance as it was dedicated to Buddha, it included many sculptures and paintings depicting the various incarnations of Buddha. The viharas were used by the monks for meditation and the study of Buddhist teachings. These were rectangular shaped halls with series of small cells attached on two sides. This is the general layout of a Buddhist monastery. Pillars in front, latticed windows, a quadrangular hall inside with a surrounding veranda. Small cells on three sides cut into the rock. And across the hall and opposite the main entrance is the chamber that houses the image of the deity. The viharas are of various sizes, the maximum being about 52 feet. They are often square shaped. Their excavation exhibits a great variety, some with simple façade, others being more ornate. Some have a porch and others do not. The hall was an essential element of a vihara. In the Vakata cafes, early viharas were not intended to have shrines because they were purely meant to be halls of residence and congregation. Later, shrines were introduced in them in the back walls which became a norm. The shrines were made to house the central object of reverence, that is the image of the Buddha, often seated in the Dhamma Chakka Pavattana Mudra or the gesture 
of teaching. Centuries passed and the plainness of the early monastic cave dwellings gave way to a preoccupation with design and majesty. The caves acquired the qualities of three-dimensional buildings, carefully hewn out of the rock face by progressively skilled artisans and craftsmen. As their work progressed, the caves became more and more elaborate, sometimes taking years to complete. The exteriors grew into richly imaginative facades. The interiors multiplied, becoming highly structured chambers for living and worship. To appreciate the caves, we need to walk back in time, to 200 BC to be precise. This journey makes us wonder, who are these people who built these caves? What was the original name of the monastery? Where are the tools used by them to build these magnificent structures? What is the faith that inspired this effort? Where did they house their workshops? The mystery of the Ajanta is that after 2000 years, we still do not know the identity of the people who lived here, worshipped here and died here. The Chinese traveller Xuan Sang's writings tell us that Dinnaga, the celebrated Buddhist philosopher and author of well-known books on logic, resided here. This, however, remains to be corroborated by further evidence. As we investigate, we realize that the caves were not excavated and worked upon in the order we find them today. It is, however, possible to date them according to a progressive artistic chronology. Thus, caves number 9 and 10 are the oldest. They were also the longest in the making, lasting 400 years from 200 BC to 200 AD, though the pillars in cave number 10 were only added around 350 AD or even later. The six caves that are numbered 4, 6, 11, 15, 16 and 17 were created between 350 and 500 AD. Interestingly, Caves 1 and 2 are the youngest of all. They were completed in the years between 626 and 728 AD. The monks who chose the location of their enterprise did not do so arbitrarily. The Ajanta Caves are situated about 130 kilometers north of Paitana, which was the ancient Pratishthana, the capital of the early Shatavahanas. They were quite close to an ancient arterial trade route that connected North India with Pratishthana in Dakshinapatha through Ujjain and Mahishmati. Ajanta also located near another trade route connecting Broch with Pratishthana. Also, they could access the ports on the southeastern coast through Ter, which was the ancient Tagara, Kondapur Amaravati, which was the ancient Dhanyakataka, and Guntapalli among other places. The painters and sculptors of the Ajanta caves were thought to have been Buddhist monks. Since craftsmen in those days were classified under their profession and their skills were taught from father to son, it is possible that many Hindu craftsmen who had accepted Buddhist faith were also working side by side with the monks. Etching art and fate into the face of solid rock, the Ajanta artist was no doubt deliberately intent on preserving his work. Rather than a need to display his personal skill to an unseen viewer in some distant future, he was prompted by the more vital urge to propagate his spiritual fate and take forward the message of the Buddha. In the 5th century, activity at the Ajanta was so brisk that work simultaneously progressed in different caves. The Viharas, caves 1, 2, 4, 6 and 7 were excavated at the outer end of the valley and 11, 16, 17 and 20 were worked on in the central sector. The other Viharas, caves 21 to 24, together with Chaityagraha, cave 26, were commenced and completed in the 6th century. 
During this time of activity, the builders broke the conventional rule and built the double-storied Vihara Cave 6. The cave has, on its ground floor, four rows of four pillars each, and on the upper floor, a Garbhagriha with standing figures of Buddha. Ajanta was believed to be a scholastic monastery. In its prime, the Viharas were intended to provide accommodation for several hundred teachers and pupils. The idea behind the Ajanta cave paintings was to propagate the message of the Buddha and to describe his life for the benefit of future generations. The sculptures and paintings in the caves detail the Buddha's life as well as his lives in his previous births referred from the allegorical Jataka tales. The walls also relate the history of the times, court and street scenes, cameos of domestic life and even animal and bird studies. The Ajanta murals are a picture of harmony between experimentation with and experience. It is this that has made it possible for the artist to achieve what we see. Although we ponder over the question from where the seeds of the Ajanta style of painting sprang forth, we know they were there. They germinated in the quiet, took form while being grafted on the walls where they were cocooned for centuries and later emerged as paintings which were vastly original and matured in a style of their own. There must have been some authoritative texts describing the relationship between concept and form, symbols and their visual representations. The Vishuddharmottara, an early treatise on Indian painting and image making, was probably compiled in the 7th century and may be roughly contemporary of the last of Ajanta paintings. It makes us acquainted with the theories prevalent at the time and of the full maturity of their practice. Studying the paintings and sculptures of the caves, we realize that our perception of a message from the past is dependent on our own spiritual development. The message of the Buddha express certain values that are suggestive and can be understood by thought pattern lying dormant in the personality of the beholder and deeply rooted in his consciousness, conditioned by the refinements of his own culture. The mural paintings have been examined in great detail with a view to determine their composition and technique and the material used in their execution. Because of the dilapidation of the murals, we can now analyze the techniques adopted by the artist with success. The ancient artist has always concealed the technicalities of his art and took pride in not exposing his secret. This also accounts for the fact that we have no reliable written records giving us sufficient information on the techniques adopted. Further, we have not been able to decipher the principles of composition which supposedly must have guided the artist in painting huge wall spaces in continuous conformity and harmonious artistic expression. We now wonder if the artist worked from a master plan when was the first outline drawn on the white plaster? Was it a direct transference of a vision? Or was it a less spontaneous act of copying from a given key sketch? Our intuition would make us feel that the walls were too big for instantaneous conception. The inner surface of the walls of the caves, cut into the hard and compact volcanic rock, serves as the carrier for the plaster on which the murals are to be painted. The surface of the carrier is rough and uneven, with deep furrows and chisel marks produced in the course of excavation of the caves. This surface lends itself well for the plaster to be laid. The integrity of the rock protects the plaster from environmental damage. There have been instances when water has reached the plaster due to cracks in the rock surface that are exposed to the outside atmosphere. Over 2,000 years on, the walls in general are still very sound, stable and relatively free from moisture. 
This ensures that the bond between the wall and the plaster remains intact, except in small patches where the plaster has broken off. The ground of the paintings is composed of mud plaster containing water and organic matter such as vegetable fibers, paddy husk, grass and other fibrous material of organic origin and rock grit or sand. Being mainly of mud, the plaster is soft and porous and does not possess the natural strength and durability of common lime plaster. The ground was prepared by the application of two coats of plaster on the cave wall. The first coat was coarse in texture with a considerable amount of fibrous vegetable material. This was then made smooth by another layer of mud and ferruginous earth. The surface was finally rendered smooth by the application of a thin layer of lime wash which was then painted over. Using only six pigments, the painters demonstrate a marvelous range and repertoire, restrained yet imaginative. The paintings are both religious and secular. They depict the Bodhisattva and the Buddha in many forms, illustrations of the Jataka tales, vegetation and animal motifs, and scenes from daily life. The paintings are everywhere, running up and down walls and pillars, straddling the ceiling, a dazzling display of deep faith and high creativity. As the monks began to scoop caves from the first century AD onwards, they evolved practical ways of working in the dark. The mashal or stick torch was smeared with vegetable oil and used for lighting dark corners. Huge mirrors were used to reflect sunshine into the interiors and large pails of water were effectively used to illuminate the ceiling. This is seen in the painting on the ceiling having a wave-like feature of water reflected on rock. The pigments used are yellow, red, blue, white, black and green along with their mixtures. All the pigments are mineral except for the black. Most of these pigments were sourced locally by the artists. It is not certain whether organic coloring materials were ever used. Anyway, time and the elements would have certainly taken their toll and such materials would have vanished without a trace. It is interesting to discover what bound all these materials together. The pigments are easily softened by water. This points to a water-soluble binding medium. Chemical analyses of the pigments have shown the existence of glue, probably animal glue in some cases. Taking everything into consideration, it is evident that the artists at Ajanta have used the tempera technique in their art. About half of the caves, whether finished or unfinished, were once adorned with paintings. As far as we know, the earliest paintings at Ajanta date back to the 2nd century BC, while the latest must have been executed over 700 years later. Over this period of time, the murals underwent stylistic changes, which are visible not only by comparing caves with caves, but also panels with panels within the same caves. The pressure of the brush makes the line appear thick or thin to have the desired effect. Thick, wide and deep lines become forms in themselves, while thin, sharp and precise lines take a calligraphic character. Even the colors of the lines assume different shades, varying from Indian red to dark brown and black, depending on particular needs, and very often changing from color to color within a limited area. The kinship between sculpture and painting that we find in Ajanta is something altogether unique in the history of world art. Most impressive is the way two art forms coexist at Ajanta, complementing each other. Artistic ingenuity has reinforced the relationship. The blending achieved must have been astonishing when the stone carvings were bedecked in color, complementing the hue and color scheme of the murals. Although we usually find thematic parallelism between sculpture and painting, they apparently functioned separately, 
using compositional references from within their own kinds. In certain instances, however, we find planned interaction. When it came to portraying Buddha himself, the artist was seemingly at his wit's end. He was to convey the impression of one who was beyond him and undepictable. He eased the task by presenting Buddha within the prescribed details of iconography and iconometry, realizing him in abstraction. The Buddha manifested himself teaching, meditating, assuring or subduing Mara and this eloquence has been conveyed by the various mudras or the poses of his hands. Even when confining him within the bonds of the brush, the artist has given him sculptural forms, dynamic and yet placid. On the rock wall are woven Jataka stories, which expound the ethics leading to the final enlightenment. The principal figure of these stories is the Bodhisattva, manifest in innumerable characters, each representing an account of the previous lives of Gautama Buddha. The Bodhisattva is a being of the divine order and therefore, even in his worldly role, is emphatic of his distinctiveness and understanding. The Bodhisattva was not necessarily a human being. He often took the form of an animal, yet expounding and meaningful. In other words, Bodhisattva is wisdom in disguise. In each new incarnation, he retains the bodily form that he has chosen for himself. He is the bridge between the two worlds, the worldly and the divine. As we proceed into the depth of the caves, the nearer we come to the image of worship. Slowly, the walls, the paintings and sculptures seem to vanish as we focus on the awe-inspiring sculptured Buddha. The entire setting is studiously premeditated. The sole intention was to prepare the pilgrim for his final revelation, for his humbling himself before the magnificent sculptured Buddha reposing in the inner shrine. The two divine bodhisattvas. These paintings have earned laurels for their rare ability of endowing personalities with a stamp of detached greatness. Large features, princely attire, imposing headgear and elaborate jewelry have made them more impressive than the rest. Even in stature and dimension, they stand in contrast to others. The artist has perhaps been more free in painting the Bodhisattva than Buddha himself. The artists were all men, probably living in great isolation and under a severe discipline, communicating with none else but themselves, monks and dedicated artisans. Conditioned by her very absence, they created the image of woman as was impressed upon their memories, idealized and platonic. The beauty and grace of the women painted by these ascetic male monks is stunning. Their figures are structured after the Tribhanga pose which is taken from classical Indian art and dance. The suggestion of rhythm, the profusion of hand gestures and the range of facial expressions verging on the sensuous belie the abstinent and spartan existence of these single-minded artists. Bodily curvatures extend themselves into every mold. Each color adds luster and each part of the body becomes a natural extension of the artist who took the greatest care in rendering the images accurately, be it male or female. On pictorial scenes crowded with people, perhaps women outnumber men. While men are engaged in more emphatic actions such as riding, giving audience, preaching or otherwise, we find women involved in activities less poignant 
and yet invitingly eye-catching, expressing surprise, sorrow, or some emotional output. As jewelry matches feminine grace, so have women contributed to the ornamentation of the scenes. Dressed in translucent muslin, allowing attention to immaculate shapes and curves, they are just living graces. Sometimes we notice difference in quality between the execution of the various parts of the human body. Therefore, it may possibly be correct to assume that several artists work together on one and the same painting, as we know was the custom with artists of the later period who excelled in miniature painting. For instance, those who specialized in portraiture and human form simply completed their part of the work, leaving the rest to be finished by others. From the artistic point of view, the paintings on the ceilings show power of imagination, perhaps even excelling the wall murals. The ceilings were set apart and did never carry religious motives, yet kept a bearing with the walls. Those drawings have taken the texture of a carpet, brilliantly woven, immediately captivating the eyes and filling the senses. They do not throw a challenge to the intellect, but cover the void above the walls with idyllic colored designs. While we look at the works in the caves, we should also keep in mind the difficulty faced by the artist to maintain a high degree of creativity while surmounting technical limitations in materials present and the medium to paint on. While time and the elements have permitted only a percentage of their talent to be displayed and the available raw materials and comparatively unsophisticated state of the art restrict their range in many ways, the breadth of their imagination is undeniably on show, deliberately and painstakingly preserved to reach out through the centuries. Artists working over a span of centuries could not have kept their bearings had not faith perfected the work of creation. Thematic steadfastness apart, stylistic changes were bound to occur, but to what extent and where it is difficult to pinpoint. The aesthetic level in the works must have its rise and fall as a works spanned over centuries. Religion is alive in the caves. The artist meditated over the blankness of the walls and then put life into his creation. The painter is as if praying with his brush on the walls. Each line and each color becomes a stroke of fate. Fate is the source of all his consciousness. The artist infuses his love for life on the walls. With the Buddhist scripture in his mind and faith in his heart, he goes far beyond the letter of the word. His actions are a complete surrender of the self to the Almighty. The Buddhist structures created during the period between the 3rd and 2nd century BC are the earliest examples of rock-cut architecture in India. The Buddhist monks built multi-storied structures carved into the rock face. Structures that contained living quarters, including spaces for sleeping, cooking and eating, and also for leading a monastic life. Many of these caves also contained shrines of the Buddha and sculptures of bodhisattvas and saints. Though not as widely known as the paintings, the architecture and sculptures at Ajanta are equally brilliant. The sculpture of Ajanta, besides possessing a certain amount of classical excellence, is of great interest and importance. Caves are naturally formed structures. Their hollow spaces are part of a natural design. In this case, however, space has been artificially created by carving deep into solid rock. A deliberate plan to ensure permanence for faith and art by working on indestructible, enduring material. 
Rock cut architecture is all about creating spaces from natural rock. There is a difference between natural cave formations that are often found sheltering religious shrines and man-made caves which are carved out of rock by man working painstakingly on hard surfaces to conjure up magnificent structures. Here is an example of the exceptional nature of the task. While carving out the interior of a cave, the monks would start from the ceiling and then work their way gradually down. If the ceiling was settled first, if it was chiseled and smoothened out before they looked at anything else, they did not have to worry about rocks dislodging themselves and tumbling down. Thus it seems more appropriate to describe their creation as sculpting rather than an ordinary building activity. Technically speaking, that would make the Ajanta caves themselves a long and remarkable series of sculptures. Creating monuments and temples in this fashion requires a deep understanding of the final vision. The craftsmen, builders and monks would have had to visualize the entire project, planning a whole range of activity on the rock face, followed by the execution of the interiors with their columns, pillars, indentations and wall display spaces and eliminating rock to reveal what they designed rather than adding material to create it. Their amazing architecture is testimony to the scientific processes and great precision that went into their creation. Skillfully scooped out of natural rock formations, the caves reveal an early existence of an admirable structural acumen. They abound with richness, supported by pillars and displaying an inspired paradigm of architecture, sculpture and painting. The work on the caves was carried out over several centuries from 200 BC to 728 AD. Sculpture in the Deccan was closely linked to architecture. Here in the Ajanta caves the sculpture grows out of the structure that accommodates it and is considered an inseparable part of it. The sculptors built shrines and niches, statues and galleries. They were mainly dedicated to the Buddha, who is depicted in the contemplative, protective and teaching poses and sometimes in the form of celestial images. As time went on and the Buddha was elevated in the popular belief from teacher to God, this change was reflected in the sculptures as well. The great Buddha was depicted in figures decidedly larger and grander than the others. The worship of Buddha as the savior of humanity had taken root in the Deccan and the artist took particular delight and care in fashioning his figure in rock. The representation of Buddha in both Chaityagrahas and Viharas became a necessity. The great halls, Chaityagrahas and Viharas display a strong influence of wooden construction so as to create an illusion of a building in wood. Such masterful integration of woodwork designs as rock architecture in a non-structural building was possible because the architect and the sculptors were mostly carpenters who took to the work of creating rock-cut mansions and soon exhibited great proficiency in this art. The craftsmen used their expertise to clone the effects of wood on the tougher medium of stone, calling up grain and texture of wood. There is a strange relationship between wood and stone in many of these caves. Some of them included wooden structures that were damaged and ruined in the course of time, while the stone continued to endure in triumph. Interestingly, even while the constructions were actually done on stone, they harbored elements of wood architecture. Walking up to cave number one, we are struck by the flurry of life on its broad, stony facade. 
Its rich ornamentation includes rows of elephants raising their trunks in salute or lifting branches, wild buffaloes turning on each other, graceful swans lazing among lotuses in a pool, and lovers engrossed in the art of love. Further on, the sculpturing clings to the architecture with floral designs, lotus medallions, jewel patterns, and mythical creatures carved tastefully on pillars and columns. It is a rich, classical feast for the eyes, a continuing display of refined artistry. Thus, the sculptors not only carved out figures and designs, but they were also responsible for the overall structure of the caves which required elaborate, imaginative planning and execution. These caves were created by architects and sculptors, not by builders and masons. The project was fired by dreams rather than blueprints. Coinciding with the deification of the Buddha, his image is embellished with a halo. This practice of placing a nimbus around an icon is derived from the Gandhara art of the 3rd and 2nd century BC and the 2nd and 3rd century AD. Gandhara art comes of a Greco-Roman Indian origin. The standing figure of Buddha in Abhaya Mudra, as in Cave 19, or seated on a lion throne as in cave 26, both carved on the front of a stupa, follow the practice originating in the Gandhara country of superimposing the cult image on the stupa. In an effort to best represent the greatness of the Buddha, a sculpture of massive proportions was carved in cave 26, where the Parinirvana statue or death of the master is found. Cave 26, a Chaityagraha, contains on its interior walls a large number of small and large sculptured panels, suggesting a definite departure from the earlier tradition of decorating the interior wall of caves with paintings. The wall space on the left of the cave is covered by two large panels connected with the life of Buddha, while the rear and right sides bear panels depicting Buddha flanked by the Bodhisattvas. In cave number 26, we find the Buddha being tempted by Mara during his meditation under the Mahabodhi tree at Bodhgaya. The scene depicts Mara's three daughters trying to seduce Siddhartha away from his goal of enlightenment. The next scene shows them sitting gloomily with their father after failing in their mission. The worship of nature spirits like the Nagas, the serpent kings of the waters and the Yakshas, the rulers of the four quarters, has an antiquity in India. Buddhism accepted these widely prevalent and popular forms of worship and stories of Nagarajas and Yaksharajas were woven around Buddha. Early Buddhist literature, including the Jatakas, is permeated with numerous tales of the exploits of these nature spirits. At Ajanta, the Nagas are represented on the door jams of the entrance doorway to the Viharas and the inner cells containing the Buddha image. The Lord of the Nagas, with his consort on his left and a standing whisk bearer on his right, carved in a niche on the flanking wall at right angles to the facade of Cave 19, is a product of superb artistry. The form of the body is graceful and slim and has an expression of peace and devotion. The lavish ornamentation, besides adding beauty to the sculpture, makes up for the paucity of costume worn by the figures. 
The shrine door of cave 6 contains a sculpture of Buddha seated in Vajrasana and protected by the snake Muchalinda. The prominent concern of course is that of depicting the Buddha in a wide range of attitudes and representations. The sculptors must have invested particular attention and love as they worked on his images, adding an edge of devotion and awe to their art. This becomes evident as we look at the enormous images of the Buddha that are carved out in the sanctums located at the back of the pillared viharas or residential quarters. This is art of the highest order. It shows how a refined sensibility can evoke subtlety even from the most implacably rigid surfaces. The diversity of other types of delicate carvings, usually sculptured on pillars and pilasters, is extremely bewildering, consisting of floral patterns, medallions depicting the full-blown lotus, the conch, makaras, hamsas, lotus creepers, pearl hangings, jewelry patterns, kirti mukhas and mythical animals. They help in creating an atmosphere of warmth, delicacy and richness. On the other side of the entrance to cave 19, we find the Buddha in the Varada Mudra pose, once again a picture of compassion. Beside him stands a woman, shorn of finery. This is none other than Amrapali, the beautiful courtesan who had mesmerized the city of Vaishali. Now she stands showing her devotion to the Buddha, having given up her former life and riches. In a moment of emotion, we grasp an entire story in stone. The sculptures tell their tales in pretty much the same manner as the Ajanta paintings do. Opening up this vast historical landscape to thousands of eager visitors from all over the world proved to be like wielding a double-edged sword. As tourists and pilgrims poured in, attracted by the beauty and magnificence of the cave paintings and sculptures, the caves emerged from the shadow of centuries-old obscurity. This flurry of human activity, though, has come at a price. From the time of their discovery, these caves and their paintings have not only impressed generations of visitors, but has also given archaeologists several anxious moments. Their concern prompted them to seek measures to stem the decay on a war footing and preserve the Ajanta monument, which has become one of the most precious World Heritage Sites. If we close our eyes, we can breathe in an ancient breeze, feel the drops of the waterfall, and hear the sound of chisel on rock. We witness the sight of hundreds of artists at work. Ajanta inspired the believers not to create art for art's sake, but to give their lives over to religion. It took the faith of generations and efforts of centuries to create these caves. We owe it to these anonymous artists to study their works with the reverence they deserve. Ajanta, a marvel of art and unique architecture that has endured the flow of time and long centuries of obscurity and now provides hours of fulfillment to millions of people who visit the caves from all over the world.